All right, so thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Zili from Tsinghua University. And today I'm going to introduce our work on how to reduce the latency for high quality real time video streaming with a technique we call Adaptive Frame Rate. This is a joint work with Tencent, MIT, and University at Buffalo. So let's start. So real time video streaming, or real time communications, or RTC, is one of the most popular applications in the recent several years. Now we are using video conferencing for work. We are using cloud gaming for entertainment. And we are also using remote controlled robots and vehicles in a lot of respective fields. And even in the last two, three years, SICOM and NSDI has already been held virtually for several times. So RTC is one of the most important applications in the internet nowadays. And for the RTC applications nowadays, there's a trend to see that the quality of RTC application is increasing. Quality here, I mean, there are two parameters for video streaming. One is the frame rate, and the other is the resolution. Frame rate is the number of video frames in a certain time of period. And the resolution is the size of each frame at the, the number of like, pixels. So for legacy RTC applications, like video chats or video conferencing, usually we can see a resolution of maybe 240p to 720p, and the frame rate of usually less than 24 FPS. But for the high quality RTC applications, we can always see a resolution of more than 2K, 4K, and sometimes 8K resolution, and also the frame rate of even high to up to 120 FPS. So this has changed a lot to the video streaming platform and pipelines. And another important feature of the next generation or the emerging RTC application is that they really ask for extremely low tail latency or low stall ratios here. So let me show you an example of what is a stall in a video. Here's a video clip I made from a YouTube video of a race car. And you can see here, just as you guys just saw here, that was a zero, only 0 0.3 second stall. Yeah, just here. So even for only 0 0.3 second stall, we can see that if you play the cloud gaming or using control of the VR, it is very fatal to the player. And when we are talking about the star rate, that is usually the number or the time of being stalled over the total time of you playing the games or you using the VR. Even the star rate is as low as one in a thousand. This still means that such a 0 0.3 second stall can happen every 300 seconds. No one wants to see such a stall every five minutes, so this is definitely not what you want. And for future applications like remote surgery, this can be even fatal. So from our observation on the cloud gaming platform, which is like Tencent's cloud gaming platform, we can see that sometimes when the RTD is low enough and with the deployment of the edge computing and edge data centers, in a lot of cases, the latency actually comes from the video chat, uh, sorry, the video client. So from our measurement of the Tencent Cloud Gaming, which is one of the largest cloud gaming in China, we can see that when there is a starter or stall from the end-to-end -end perspective, usually there are more than a half cases where the stall is contributed by the client device instead of the network. Because we are usually deploying the edge data centers in every city and in every region, so the network RTD is actually extremely low. And in this case, client device latency is very important. So where does the client device latency come from? The observation here from our paper is that the increased video quality can actually overload the video client. So what does this mean? So let me still go to the example of the legacy RTC. In legacy RTC, the network stack and the video decoder, they are two separate processes. So in this case, there must be a buffer in the middle to handle the, the packets or frames or whatever from one process to the other. And here is what we call decoder queue. And for the legacy RDC, when the frame rate is low, that means when frames arrive at this buffer or this decoder queue, the arrival rate is actually quite low. For example, 10 frames per second or maybe, maybe 5 frames per second. And when the, <clears throat> when the resolution is high, that means the decoding speed is pretty fast. So in this case, the decoder can decode the, the frames from the queue at a very high speed, so it means a high departure rate. With a low arrival rate and high departure rate, that turns to a very empty decoder queue here. But for high quality RDC, this is different. In this case, when the network is sending frames at a very high frame rate, that means the arrival rate of the decoder queue is increasingly high. And when the decoder is decoding high resolution frames, that means the decoding time for each frame is going to be even longer, leading to an even lower departure rate. So in this case, when the high arrival rate meets the low departure rate, in some certain corner cases, we can see an overloaded decoder queue here. And this is even increasingly severe in the future. So we made a survey on the recent papers from uh, two aspects. 
Here you can see that the red dashed lines on this figure is the, the trend of the need of the international, uh, sorry, internet video streams in the last 20 years. And the x-axis is the timeline, the y-axis is the speed of the video stream or the quality of video streams. So we basically measure or count the resolutions, the frame rates from YouTube, from Twitch, from a lot of the streaming platforms and to see how fast they can provide the video streams. And the, the fitness and the regulation shows that the application demands actually doubles about every 20 months. And on the other hand, we also make a survey on the papers in the ISSCC and the JSSC, both of which are the top conferences and journals in the ASIC designs, and to see how the hardware capacity is increasing in the last 20 years. And the result shows that the hardware capacity of the video codex is usually doubling about 27 months, which is even longer than the increase of the application demands. So now in somewhere in the middle, maybe now, maybe like five years from now, we can see they're actually matching with each other. So in the future, this can be even more severe because the application demand is increasingly faster than hardware capacity. All right, so here comes our main insight. So recall that there are two parameters in this part. One is the resolution and the other is frame rate. Here, our insight is to we can adapt the frame rate to alleviate the transient decoder overloads because since the decoder is overloaded, we need to do something to make sure the decoder is no longer overloaded. So for these two parameters, which one should we choose to adapt? A lot of work use the adaptive frame rate or resolution, but maybe this is not very suitable on one hand to alleviate the load on the decoder and on the other hand for the real-time video streaming applications. Because if we want to adapt the resolution, usually we need to ask for a new keyframe, and which is actually a quite large traffic burst for the network and will incur an additional latency for the end-to-end -end transport. So we therefore adapt the frame rate from the practical concerns to alleviate the overload here. But here's another challenge here. There are a lot of work in the networking community on managing the queues, or the, like in the routers, or in the clients, or in the server side. And ex which is, well, one of them is called AQM, Active Queue Management Mechanisms. So in computer networks, most of the AQM mechanisms usually control the queue length reactively. So what does reactive mean here? Usually people will preset the control target. For example, the queue length should be around five, eight, or maybe 10 packets. And when the queue, actual queue length is less than or smaller than the control target, it will somehow signal the sender to reduce the sender rate. For example, in this case, the sender can know that, okay, I can still increase the sender rate to fully utilize the link. And if the queue is longer than the control target, the sender can also reduce the sender rate to try to drain the queue and to control the, to make the queue back to the original control target. That sounds perfect, right? But in our cases, the element or the basic unit in the queue is no longer packets. They are video frames. And in this case, even there is only one video frame in the queue. That is still means that the queue can be around, around several tens of milliseconds. Because for each video frame, the interval between frames is around several tens of milliseconds. So this is not, definitely not what we want. Even if we set the queue to one, we are still going to see a queue of around 10 milliseconds. And this is increasingly, incredibly high for the end-to-end -end transport. So our solution here is to predictively adapt the frame rate. So here's the trees we collect from the real-world production servers. And the x-axis is the timeline here. And the y-axis here is the, the value of each, each, uh, each value here. And here, we can first see that the Q length in this case may be increasing from the frame number nine and number 10. So if we are using the Q length based information or control mechanisms, we can only make any reaction after frame number nine, which is the place where Q length begins to increase. But however, the increase of the Q length is the consequence of the mismatch between the arrival and the service processes. So in this case, actually at frame number three, we can see that the decoding delay, or basically the departure rate, is actually matching the arrival rate. So we can somehow predict that, or we can have the sense that they are going to leave some queues in the future. So our solution is instead of utilizing the queue information, we are utilizing the information from the arrival and departure processes to estimate the queuing delay. So in this part, here is something quite theoretical from the queuing theory. So one of the most common, commonly used technique to estimate the queuing delay based on the arrival and the service process is called the Kingman's formula. I'm not going to touch the technical details here, but I'm trying to deliver the high-level idea of this formula to you. The Kingman's formula is trying to estimate the queuing delay of any processes based on the arrival and departure stochastic processes. So it is, it is determined by three factors here. The first one is the 
rate ratios, basically the arrival rate over the departure rate. And in this case, you can see the term in red. That means that if the arrival or service rate is not matching with each other, we can see an increasing term for the first one. And what is more important here is that Keyman's formula has another term for the fluctuation. Here, C and CS, they are the coefficient of variance, basically the deviation over the average value. So in this case, if the arrival or the departure process is too fluctuating, we can still have some robustness or redundancy to make sure the queue is not too long. And of course, it is also uh, proportional to the decoding speed. And there are a lot more practical concerns which more details are left in the paper, but from the high-level idea, decoder is definitely not the only one that is going to build the queue. There are a lot more factors that can actually contribute to the formulation of the queue. For example, the decoder degradation. Because of the overheat, sometimes the video frames are decoded in the hardware codec, that is fine. But if the user device is just too hot, the frequency can actually be lowered, which will lead to degradation of the video frames. And there are also wireless throttling, which leads to the bursty arrival of the network, which will also transiently increase the queue. And there are also some failures in the decoder, which might also contribute to the decoder stops. And we designed several respective de design blocks in the paper, trying to control each patterns or each root cause separately to make sure that the overall end-to-end -end transport latency is controlled. All right, so the final part is the experiment part of our paper. So we made a large-scale trace-driven simulations from the Tencent Cloud Gaming. We collect traces in the format of the network RTT, and also the decoding delay, and also this, a lot of other delays, like the CPU scheduling delay, and so on. And we collect the traces for more than 40,000 hours with more than 30,000 user sessions for more than two weeks. So we formed such a very big data set to measure the performance of the decoding versus the network. And we compare AFR, our solution, with several baselines. The first is just the, the vanilla solution in like Viper RDC and in a lot of open source frameworks, like Jobtail. So it will do nothing until the queue is overflowed, and it will drop frames and finally lead to the uh, decrease of the sending rate, and finally leads to a drain of the queue. And there's another work from our group called Frame Skip, which tries to also skip frames based on the queue length and also the queue information. But if you need modifications on the video codec. And we also compare different modules or different design blocks inside the FR to see how different design block is going to be in effect for the overall performance. So the metric here we are going to evaluate is the ratio of end-to-end -end latency, more than 100 milliseconds. This is how we define starter here. We have more user study on this to, see, to, to set the values why we use 100 milliseconds here. So here, on the y-axis, we can see that the starter ratio, or the end-to-end -end latency of more than 100 milliseconds for job tail and AFR, AFR can actually reduce this starter ratio by more than a half. And even for the frame skip, which actually requires the modification of the video codec, we can still achieve an improvement of around 20%. And let alone, we can see further improvement on the different design blocks of AFR ourselves and to see the further improvements. All right, so the final takeaway of my talk today is that the increased video quality is actually overloading the decline decoder queue. And AFR, our solution, we will try to adapt the frame rate instead of the bit rate or resolution as the previous work did based on network conditions and decoder conditions to make sure the queue at the decoder is going to be controlled at a low level. And AFR is de actually deployable in the current video codec, and it has actually been deployed in the production service in Tencent Cloud Gaming for two years. And even for the real-world A-B test, we can see the improvement of more than one-third in like, large-scale A-B tests. So, all right. Thank you so much for listening to my talk today. And this simulator has already been open source. If you want to take a look, you can go to here and see for a simulator to reproduce results yourself. And I'm happy to take any questions.